The one I see the most is a long, strikingly thin face and big black eyes. I've got to know my father, who is a Palladian from a planet in the star system called Treshuus. There are millions of wanderers or extraterrestrial souls living on Earth who don't know that they are extraterrestrial souls. Then I saw a fourth one, and it started to land. This is UFO Chronicles, and I'm Lee Majors. Since the dawn of time, we have looked to the heavens and asked the question, are we alone? In the next hour, we'll look into a variety of stories, mostly from everyday people who claim to have experienced a UFO sighting, to have had a UFO encounter, or even an alien abduction. It's perhaps fitting that we start with a first-hand account of alien abduction from a man who claims to have been abducted a number of times, a man who has recounted his experiences in his best-selling books. On December the 26th, 1985, in the middle of the night, I found myself waking up in the presence of some extremely strange figures with huge, dark eyes, and I could not get out of the nightmare. Ultimately, I was forced to conclude something unknown had happened. I had been in the presence of the unknown on that night. This was the first in a series of encounters with what Whitley Strieber describes as undeniably real, fierce, and quite amazing creatures who are visiting Earth. Taken out of his cabin and into a wooded area, Strieber claims these humanoids took him to the interior of a UFO. I woke up in a little round rather messy room that was stuffy and full of these very rapidly moving apparitions, I would call them, and uh, uh, with an automatic voice that kept repeating, what can we do to help you stop screaming? I remember something being fired into the side of my head that made a flash in my eyes and left an injury that I felt later, a red swollen place uh, on my temple, and it hurt. It hurt like, you know, it was achy. It, like it was sore. I said, you have no right at one point, and they said, we do have a right. Strieber describes his emotion during the situation as horrifying, an unbelievable terror he had never experienced before in his life. Subsequent to the experience, I was f equally frightened because I thought that I had some sort of disease that had caused a, a uh, spectacularly vivid hallucination. Strieber eventually underwent a series of psychological and neurological tests, and even a polygraph examination. It was concluded that there was nothing wrong with him, physically or mentally, and he passed the polygraph. Other encounters followed. He became less frightened of them over the years, and eventually came to think of these experiences as fascinating adventures, a chance to see a completely different spectrum of human understanding, and even beyond that. It's fascinating. It, I realized after the first three or four years that I, no matter how startling it got, that I obviously was not being hurt. So I started to relax and enjoy it because, boy, I mean, what a trip. It's a fa fabulous trip. Aliens themselves, he says, vary from the bizarre looking to ones who seem to be quite human in everything, except for their personal effect and demeanor. The one I see the most is a long, strikingly thin face and big black eyes and uh, uh, stares into you with those eyes and it feels like a hurricane blowing into your soul when it happens. It's a very powerful experience. The impression most of us have of aliens are those of a higher intelligence. Could it be these beings have as much to learn as we do? My observation of them is that they don't have higher intelligence than we do. 
Uh, I've seen them make plenty of mistakes. I've seen them get confused. I do think that they have a level of mind that we don't have. I think that they can see beyond time and that they can ma manipulate their, their relationship to physical reality differently from the way we can. Strieber received thousands of letters from people all over the world. The startling fact is that the detailed descriptions of their encounters with aliens were similar. I'm sure that every night and day all over the world this is happening to more and more people. Physical evidence of these visits from the aliens come in the form of markings on their bodies. I have a little shadow in my finger which came there when I was about age nine. I have only the dimmest memories of a very violent and noisy experience in which it happened. In a culture of denial where anything outside the human understanding is dismissed as abnormal or improbable. Streeper's claims are viewed with skepticism. I think that skepticism is healthy. I don't think that it's appropriate to say a thing is true or untrue. Streeper claims that at this moment, there are about two to two and a half million people in this country who've had face-to-face -face encounters. It's a hard pill for some of these skeptics to swallow. In 1963, Carl Sagan wrote an essay saying, that we'd probably be visited by aliens on the average of every 10,000 years. So why not now? It doesn't seem at all improbable to me. I don't know what the, I don't know what the big, all the screaming about it can't be possibly true, it can't be true is. It's very strange. Why, why wouldn't it be true? The universe is such a huge place. One question remains. Why don't these aliens make a public appearance? Eventually it'll reach a critical point where enough people have been acclimatized so that as a species we will basically be able to handle it. And if I know the visitors, they will appear publicly about one second after that moment is reached. Fear obviously plays a big role in our expectancies of these creatures. If they come here to harm us, how could we defend ourselves? And if they come here in friendship, how would we know? They seem to want us to come into contact and resensitize ourselves to our souls and to begin to see the world in a broader way, I think they might be looking for a companion. I don't know what they are. We may not even be able to put into words what they are. We may not have the language to explain it. One fact remains. As Whitley Strieber wrote in his book, Breakthrough, The Next Step, whatever it is, it's something outside of human beings, not something human minds can understand. Whitley Strieber is not alone in his alien encounter. As we delve into the UFO chronicles, we hope to shed more light upon the subject. In fact, many people not only say extraterrestrials exist, but they say they've actually had personal contact with them. For these people, the experience of being abducted has often left them terrified. Look through any bookstore and you'll find a variety of books containing detailed accounts of abductions and apparent human research by aliens. Often they're written by psychologists, PhDs, and MDs. Often reports were elicited from patients during hypnosis. Many give detailed descriptions of their abductors. Some have made intricate sketches from their memories, and some abductees even maintain that they were impregnated and gave birth to hybrid offspring on subsequent abductions. But just imagine, if you had such an experience, who would you tell? And would they believe you? Psychologists say most abductees would be reluctant to go public with their bizarre stories. And for these reasons, those who have come forward may only be the tip of the iceberg. We were contacted by a young lady from Montana who agreed to tell her story with the stipulation that we not show her face or divulge her name on television. Here's her extraordinary account. The reason I've decided to tell this now is because I want other people who have had similar experiences to know that they're not alone. They're not crazy. I was going to school in Missoula, and it was spring break, so I was headed home to see my folks. The sun was going down when I hit the cutoff to 191. You know, it gets pretty windy and, and slow in that area. It's very desolate. After a while, I came around this one curve, and I saw this really 
bright light. It was in the middle of the road. It was so blinding. At, at first, I thought it was the spotlight from like a police car. But then I realized that it was too high off the ground to be coming from a car. So I put my foot on the brake, but it didn't do anything. I, I just kept going. The motor ran like my foot was still on the gas. But then the truck slowed down and, and stopped right in front of that light. I was so scared. I had absolutely no control over my body. As much as I didn't want to go, I, I opened the car door and I started walking towards the light. All of a sudden, I went out, and everything was dark all around me. But it was like I could make out this ramp. And then all of a sudden, this door went up. I couldn't see what the door was in. My eyes were fixed on the opening. I started walking in. It was like my body just took me in. And I don't know what happened. I guess I must have blacked out because one minute I'm walking and the next minute I woke up on this table, like a medical table. All these medical instruments were poking at me and I could hear this whirring sound, like a dentist drill, but not quite that loud. I couldn't feel any pain when they touched me. I couldn't feel anything at all, really. I just felt like my body was made of lead. I couldn't move. Even my fingers, I, I wanted to see who was doing this to me, but my eyes wouldn't move. I was totally paralyzed. I don't even know how long I was lying there. It seemed like time was different. And then, I guess I must have blacked out again. The next thing I remember, I was back in my truck. The motor was still running and the bright light was gone. My head hurt, it ached, but I got back on the road feeling very confused. I looked at my watch, it was 1 a.m. I'd expected to be home by 10. I finally made it home. I went in and looked in the mirror. I couldn't see any marks on my body, but I knew I didn't dream this. Then I looked at my head. Right inside the hairline, there was this, this little mark. It's never gone away, and it's been a year now. For a long time, I didn't tell anyone about this. Graduated now, and I, I have a good job. People would think I'm crazy, but I know this really happened. If it were only one person, it would be harder to believe. But when you compare all the various accounts and see the similarities from one to another, perhaps it could start to make even you a believer. We've just heard of alien abductions. Many victims recount stories of medical experiments performed by aliens while others claim to have been impregnated by these visitors. Now we hear from people alleging to be the offspring of such encounters. It can be a traumatic experience to meet your biological parents if you've been adopted. But what if your father is an alien? This is the story Eddie Page told us. I am a genetic experiment that has evolved for the last 40 plus years. People I've come to know are from a star system called the Pallades. I am one of their children, and I am one of many children. I want people to know that I am not the only one, because I have seven sisters who are identical to me. I am a, a, a sister of the seven, seven sisters of Eddie Page, the hybrid alien. I don't like the word alien. I like to call us celestial beings. From the period of 1953 to 1955, with the knowledge that the United States government received from these beings from the Pallades, there was uh, genetic experiments allowed for certain technology exchange. 
Under the understanding that this technology would be used for the benefit of all mankind, there was a list given to the United States government of the women that was selected at random to participate in these genetic experiments. My mother happened to be one of them participants. My mother wasn't supposed to have children. She had a complete hysterectomy, but about four months later, I was born. When we were born, we were sent back out west, we've been told, to a base, a military-sponsored base, where these children were analyzed and kept in isolation. And then the government selected government-sponsored families to raise these kids as, as humans. I have been experiencing things all of my life, not realizing uh, what it all meant until about the last nine months, ten months. And uh, as a child, I was experiencing beings in my bedroom. What was your first encounter like? It was very traumatic to actually see something that I've been raised all my life that doesn't exist to actually see a craft land in front of me and beings come off and say, they are why I'm here. I've got to know my father, who is a Palladian from a planet in the star system called Treshuus. I have been a healer all my life, and I've had a light that pulsates through my body, uh, which has uh, had a tremendous effect on catastrophic diseases. Eddie told us about an unusual experience he had while in the Marine Corps in Vietnam. Our mission was to assassinate the premier of uh, North Vietnam. At this time, there was 12 of us who sent out on this reactionary team, and we were, uh, something went haywire, and every one of us got killed. And I remember, all of a sudden, there was no existence no more. It was just like everything had stopped for me, and I remember a very bright white light. I, I don't know where it came from, but the next thing I know that I'm looking down and I'm seeing my body being restructured. I'm seeing some odd, there was like seven or eight odd looking beings. They were working on me. When Eddie was taken up on the ship, I was by his side the whole time and uh, administering my light to him, to his forehead, while they were replacing his body with the eight alien organs. And then, Next thing I know, I'm found 11 days later in a, a rice paddy, and I'm picked up by the U.S. Army, who fly me back to Nang. Medical records and medical tests done here in the past year and a half have substantiated what I've been saying, that uh, a lot of my internal system, my heart, my blood cannot be identified, uh, even to the existence I have an extra vertebrae and an extra rib. Eddie and his sister Victoria report seeing the Pleiadians often. They'll always throw flares. Sometimes they'll, they'll throw as many as 20 flares down in a location, kind of a little celebration. They will, they will show, throw out streamers, which like what she says, like they look like flares. And what they are, they are electrical streamers, and they, they charge the atmosphere. And, and this is a, a way of identifying themselves. According to Eddie, the Pleiadians have been visiting our planet for thousands of years, nurturing our growth. And, he says, the best is yet to come. I will tell you, probably in the year 1997, there's going to be one of the most beautiful announcements in the world has ever known. It's going to be the greatest event that mankind has ever known. The search for unidentified flying objects is one of the most popular pursuits of our time. There are more reports of UFO activity today than ever before. Are we alone in the universe? Have other beings visited our Earth? And has the government hidden the truth from us? The interest in the subject keeps growing and growing. We went to Bob Brown's annual international UFO Congress. One of the questions asked was, is the government covering up what they know about ETs and UFOs? The governments have got their ways of keeping their secrets, as many secrets they've been keeping for years and years and years, which the public uh, probably will never ever find about. They've, they've got their ways of suppressing people, but I think the biggest thing they ever did was create the aura of ridicule around the subject. Uh, they, it was a, a, a wonderfully orchestrated thing where people who lived in response, uh, worked in responsible positions and this kind of thing, 
uh, because of the ridicule syndrome that went with this thing, that they were in imminent danger of being uh, branded lunatics and losing their positions. Anybody who talked about the subject was branded an idiot. But of course that only went for so long and after many, many more people started to have encounters and experiences, sooner or later this thing was going to surface. And that's precisely what it's doing at this moment in time. I was fortunate a number of years ago to have a cosmic top secret clearance when I was at Shape NATO. That clearance allowed me access to the Shape NATO study that they did from 1961 to 1964. And at the completion of that three year study, they concluded that we were not alone, we'd probably never been alone. That we were being visited, surveyed, studied, or some, some program of some kind was underway by several and I want to repeat several high-technology extraterrestrial civilizations. The impact of that alone on me was kind of earthshaking. They determined as a result of their three-year study that there did not appear to be a military threat involved, which was basically the primary purpose of the study itself in the first place. Daniel Sheehan is the well-respected lawyer who broke the Karen Silkwood case. He also exposed the Iran-Contra scandal to Congress. He told us that President Carter asked the head of the Science and Technology Division of the U.S. Congress Research Office to find out about UFOs. She began to prepare the data, was given access to both unclassified and some classified data to, to prepare her report. And it was on the basis of this uh, analysis that she did and supervised uh, out of the Congressional Research Office that she came to the official conclusion that there was from one to two other uh, intelligent, highly developed civilizations uh, within our galaxy, uh, other than uh, our planet. Now that was a fairly extraordinary finding, uh, but it exists on the record as an official finding of the Congressional Research Office, and it was communicated uh, to the Congress and then to the President. Uh, at that point, uh, nothing more was done to release the information officially uh, to the American public. But the public's not buying. Jose Escamil shoots videos of UFOs 10 hours a day, every day. He sees them at Midway, a small community close to Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, we recently captured a V formation of about 32 huge 50-foot in diameter dome objects that are flying in formation. And with, beyond a doubt, they're not geese. You know, uh, there's nothing that suggests a neck or wing flutter. We have, we have 800 hours of daytime footage of UFOs, anywhere from one to 100 per day. And for that to happen so blatantly and in broad daylight, I think that's definitely something behind it. What I consider to be profound is when you see something in the sky that is of extraordinary proportions and is sitting there and it's circular and it's just sitting there you think it's a balloon but then you look at it and it starts gliding you know and then you see other things just flashing by at extreme speeds and you're you're saying ah am I, are my eyes playing with me or do i get sky blind or what is that and this thing just moves and glides effortlessly and then when you go back and see it on tape and you go freeze frame and you see hundreds of other objects around that that you didn't see with a naked eye, that's very profound to me. We have brought you stories of UFO sightings and UFO cover-ups and even alien abductions. Now we've uncovered an even more bizarre twist to the category. It seems there are a group of people numbering in the thousands who claim to be from other worlds, but for the time being reside on this planet. It certainly raises the question that decades ago was simply a joke. Could your neighbor be an alien? I wrote this book basically for two reasons. The first is that there are millions of wanderers or extraterrestrial souls living on Earth who don't know that they are extraterrestrial souls. They felt different all their lives, uh, and they couldn't make sense of it. And the second reason is that um, the UFO phenomenon, as we see it shown in the media today, is generally slanted towards fear. ET souls are souls that are not native to Earth. Generally, they are hundreds of thousands or millions of years older than consciousness on Earth. So 
These souls choose to come to Earth for one or many lifetimes, ultimately to be of service, which means to offer what they can through their higher consciousness, generally means love and wisdom and kindness. The main group, however, of extraterrestrials are wanderers. And in my opinion, there are 70 to 100 million extraterrestrial souls living on Earth now, the majority of whom don't know it. Besides wanderers, there are walk-ins. We talked with Aria, a woman who calls herself a walk-in. A walk-in is a being that had a soul exchange with a person born here on Earth. In this particular instance, Catherine, the former self, was on a vacation in the high Austrian Alps, which is an incredibly high and pure region. While, while there on a vacation, she had a death experience where the physiological body became dead, if you will, though, that, though death is, again, a perception. But the body was clinically dead for 27 minutes. It was in that time that her soul was led out by her guides and angels as my soul transferred into the body, again being sent directly by the Lord God Most High to serve humankind. Our soul emanates from the Pleiades, which is the seven sister star region in the constellation of Taurus. We are, by your Earth standards, Pleiadean, extraterrestrial in form, although we house a physical body as you or anyone else upon the planet does. On display were sculptures Ario did of Pleiadians and also of biblical figures who once walked the earth. With what Aria called Christic energy, she claims that Catherine had no such skills, for all the sculpting has occurred after the soul transference. One of the questions we wanted to know was whether one would know if they, or someone they knew, was either a walk-in or a wanderer. In the book, actually, and in the newsletter, I offer the Sleeping Wanderer's Quiz. There are 12 indications so a person can know whether they are or are not an extraterrestrial soul. Basically, from childhood, there's the experience of differentness, not belonging, not fitting in. These people generally come from loving, uh, supportive families. Uh, as children, sometimes they looked up to the night sky and said, take me home. We, as with all of the ascended beings, read the intent of the soul within each and every individual. You see, the soul is divinely designed to be God at the core and at the purest of its elements. And so, it is our gift that when we come upon someone that is being less than truthful, or that is clouded with deceit, is it, it is an instantaneous energy transmission. So we may read this very easily. Where does one find these star souls? Well, according to Scott, they are everywhere. To our pleasant surprise, one person overheard us and felt an immediate connection. I couldn't understand it when people used to try to pick fights with me because I had red hair. Today, more than ever, I can't understand it because of the upsurge in, in uh, violent behavior, especially with young people. I felt that um, a lot of my childhood experiences were, were out of the ordinary. I used to hear astral, what they call astral music. When I'd wake up on a Saturday morning, I would hear uh, like distant trumpets and, and voices and things like that. The desert isn't the only place where UFO sightings can occur. We've discovered an area in the Pacific Northwest where strange night lights have been spotted. An area nestled in the Cascade Mountains of Central Oregon has been the center for many UFO sightings. And it is this area around the peaks called the Three Sisters that has reported the largest amount of recent UFO sightings. In the 1840s, these three volcanic mountains were named Faith, Hope, and Charity by the local Methodist camp. They later became known collectively as the Three Sisters. The U.S. Forest Service has designated the vast remote area the Three Sisters Wilderness Area. Open only to hikers, it's a place that has very little human disturbance. Most commonly, UFO reports involve a single passing or hovering ship in the air. But we were recently contacted by a backpacker who had the incredible experience of seeing several ships together on the ground. 
Now here is her amazing story. Well, it was spring and it was just starting to warm up and I thought I'd take a hike for a couple of days out in the Three Sisters. I hiked in about three hours and I got to a place where there were some great rock formations. I thought I'd camp there so I could hike around in the rocks in the next morning. I put my tent up on this kind of butte where I had this fantastic view. Then, I don't know, I think it was about three in the morning, I woke up because there was this, this bright light shining in through the tent. It was really, really weird. I couldn't imagine what it could be. I looked outside and I couldn't believe it. Down below at the base of those huge rocks, I saw three circular objects. They were really bright, lighting up the whole area. It was the strangest thing I ever saw. I remember thinking, nobody is ever gonna believe this. Then I saw a fourth one and it actually was in the air, kind of hovering, and it started to land with the other ones. I was totally amazed. I started to feel very strange, like very weak all of a sudden. I'm not sure what happened then. All I know is I woke up outside the tent on the ground. I looked down there and there was nothing anywhere. I never sleepwalked in my life. I knew what I'd seen was real. I had to go down there and look around. There weren't that many trees in there with all the rocks, but the ones that were there were all charred. And there were these powdery ashes scattered around. I'm not one of those people that goes looking around for UFOs, but I'm convinced that this was something from another world. But the story doesn't end there. Only days later, photographs and videos were taken in the area showing UFOs strikingly similar to those described by Karen. This shot was snapped by a local woman from her back porch. You can see two of the three sister peaks in the background. And this photo was taken by a tourist as he stood at a viewpoint area overlooking Bend. And this dramatic picture was captured on the night of May the 6th near the town of Sister Oregon. Extraordinary, but possibly the most interesting of all is this home video footage shot by a Los Angeles tourist, Jeff Kendall. When it's played back in slow motion, it's quite incredible. Are UFOs now focusing on Oregon because they have work to do there? Or is it just trendy for now? Either way, locals keep a close eye on the sky. On a starry night, you see beautiful spears of light racing across the horizon, defying all earthly logic. After doubting your own perceptions, the next question you may ask is, are we alone? We asked. And you might be surprised by the answers we received. UFOs have been visiting the planet Earth before recorded history. And this goes clear back beyond even the Old Testament, which is dated by Archbishop Usher as 4000 BC. Uh, the modern UFO phenomenon, or should I say the modern UFO wave, began in February of 1942 with an incident called the Battle of Los Angeles, in which a UFO actually parked itself over the city of Culver City for a period of several hours. And a photograph of this object actually appeared on the front page of the Los Angeles Times and the Wall Street Journal at that time. And then, of course, the later incidences began to occur with the crash of uh, what we believe to be extraterrestrial saucers outside of Roswell, New Mexico. And then uh, the famous sighting of uh, Kenneth Arnold over Mount Rainier, who coined the term flying saucers, which is where we get the term flying saucers today. UFO sightings have taken place over major cities and in full view of many, many people. For instance, the one that was taken over San Francisco, California. We have pictures of UFOs that were taken in formation, if you please, over Washington, D.C. 
And then there were some over Baltimore. There were some over Miami, Florida. Some over Chicago. Some over New York City, seen by many, many people. Only these particular sightings, for some reason, did not make the front pages. Since the sightings in Mexico City began, we have actually had more mass sightings by more people. Uh, a pair of rather large flying saucers actually parked themselves over Mexico City, were videotaped from hundreds of different locations, and were witnessed by close to 27 million people. Gulf Breeze, Florida is uh, particularly hot right now. Fife, Alabama. Uh, there are uh, areas in Wisconsin uh, which are very, very uh, rife with activity. Uh, just recently in the media, there have been places in uh, Michigan uh, along the lakes there, along Lake Michigan, on the uh, eastern shore of Lake Michigan, in which there's been a mass amount of activity. Uh, for many years, there was uh, activity at a place called Area 51, which I personally had blown the lid off of and investigated. And, uh, until, and I believe a lot of that was military activity, and I believe it was moved in the early part of 1994. One of the hot spots on the desert, as far as UFO communication and landings and sightings are concerned, uh, seemed to be the uh, high desert area in Giant Rock, right near Yucca Valley. That seems to be a place where people congregate by the hundreds, and they do see some strange things out there. Another place is on the edge, which is called the mailbox area of Area 51, not too far from Las Vegas, Nevada. You will see things in the sky that defy human imagination. The international organization, the United Nations, promotes peace and unity between the countries of the world. It's only a question of time before the planets of the universe require such a council for galactic matters. Who are we and what is our role in the universe? Planet Earth is part of a great cosmic drama. Our journey to become part of another galaxy has already begun. Sheldon Niddle and Peggy McConnell have made it their mission to guide us through this journey. They claim to represent planet Earth in the Galactic Federation. The Galactic Federation is a group right now of over, or just about 200,000 star systems and star leagues whose sole process and purpose is to bring light into this galaxy. The Galactic Federation acts as the United Nations for the planets in the Cyrus Galaxy. Sirius is a star system. It's approximately 8.3 light years from us. A light year is approximately 5.9 trillion miles. Sheldon says that in order for us to become part of the Cyrus star system, we have to change. And that is where the Galactic Federation comes in. The Federation is here to help us shift as humans into our full consciousness. What is happening is, we have been designated as a major galactic center or showcase for the entire concept of moving our entire galaxy. He claims the Galactic Federation has instructed him to prepare planet Earth for its major journey to another solar system. There is a telepathic link between Sheldon and Syrians. I was briefed by, uh, by a whole group of Syrians. There's a Syrian computer ship way out in the outer parts of our particular star system, our solar system. So I'm constantly in contact, I'm constantly getting information, I'm constantly being told what's going on, both up there and down over here. The Galactic Federation has a tremendous task in the galaxy. Well, right now, they are controlling the different gates, stargates, which are the interdimensional portals through which all the different groups go. Both Peggy and Sheldon are in contact with the Galactic Federation on a daily basis. He'll get the ship's reports, where I'll get the uh, counseling reports, or I'll get the medical team reports. I have a ship and I have a command. My primary purpose is counseling. And I'm able to communicate with the different civilizations, different planets, and different processes. Sheldon has been contacted by the Syrians since childhood. I've been afraid to say it to anybody because I thought they would say I was totally crazy. Most of us right now are here for a basic purpose. That purpose is to help this planet shift into its full galactic crystalline consciousness, as I like to call it, and also help all of us as Earth beings, as Earth humans, become fully conscious beings. 
Reaching full consciousness means major changes in our outlook on life and in our physical bodies. As planet Earth's electrical and magnetic fields collapse, the atoms and the composition of the DNA in our bodies will be modified to form a new body. We will not be living in the third dimensional reality, but in the reality of the galactic light. The fundamental physical changes also lay in the composition of our DNA. If we would just open our eyes and see that we are the blessings and we are the gift, that really is going to transform our whole galaxy. Because we are being shifted spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and most importantly, physically as well. Once we have reached our full potential, we will be ready for the final part of the journey. As Earth approaches the photon belt in the near future, it will mark the end of our present civilization as we know it. The photon belt is a huge mass of light and energy. It will be responsible for moving our solar system into a higher dimension, the fifth dimension. Our planet will move to a new position in space, closer to the Sirius star system. Then we will be in a wholly new set of rela spatial relationships. Once our planet has shifted to the new position in space, we will become part of the Sirius star system. The Sirius galaxy is said to be a number of civilizations together, most of them looking like us in their physical appearance. Some are smaller, some are bigger, some are almost transparent, some are even more uh, humanoid looking, if that's possible, than we are. They have all different skin colors. They are basically our ancestors. They're also, as part of this entire civilization of the Galactic Federation, non-human groups, such as uh, amphiboids, you might call them like salamander or frog-type peoples, uh, reptoid peoples. Sheldon told me that one Syrian council, Washta, has guided him through his life. Washta is a person I've been very close to since I was a little, little boy. I've seen more and more that the message that he gave me and is continuing to give me is a message of great incredible love and hope for our planet. Sheldon feels that it will be easy to convince people of this incredible change because it has already started. They feel deep in here in their heart that it's true because they feel that experience inside themselves as well. And this whole new reality is our full conscious planet, our full conscious galactic civilization, and the final intermixing and contact with the whole process of our space brothers and sisters and ourselves coming together again. They say we will play an important role in the Syrian galaxy. Because we're going to be the teachers the next round. And so it's very exciting to see, even in the Bible it says that the last shall be first. Well, we're the last planet to go conscious in the solar system, but the next round of our solar system will be the teachers to teach these other planets how to use free will, how to be loving, and how to be compassionate. If the Galactic Federation is right, the planets of the entire galaxy will be reuniting again for the first time in billions and billions of years. When you think of our little planet in relation to the vastness of the universe, it seems silly to say that we are the only life forms in existence. If we could agree that life in other galaxies, other solar systems, and on other planets is a probability, then it would make sense that they would be interested in space exploration just the way we are. Something to think about. I'm Lee Majors, and thank you for joining us.